Uh, please take a seat so we can start because we're already a little bit late. Um, we're, I think, about 25 minutes late. Um, so I'll try to keep us uh, reasonably on time. Um, we might take a little bit of time out of our lunch, but who needs lunch when you're having fun? So um, my name is Robert Sparrow from ANU and the Indonesia Project. Uh, I'll be chairing this session. Uh, we have three speakers. Um, we have um, uh, Salut Mahudin from Macquarie University. We have Tommy Furman from the Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, and we were planning to have Henry Sunday from uh, the World Bank. Unfortunately, Henry uh, had to cancel his, uh, his trip. Uh, but um, Peter McCauley um, has been so kind to take his place and he'll just present his slides. Um, uh, so that's a slight change to the, to the schedule. Um, for those of you who, who have seen the, um, yeah. <laughs> For those of you have, who have seen the, the, um, the program uh, and who have seen the pictures might also think that one of the other speakers uh, missed the plane, uh, but we got the picture wrong for Tommy. Um, so our apologies for that. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I give the, the floor to Salud. Okay, uh, selamat siang. This is up down, yeah? Okay. Thank you uh, for introduction, Rob. And first of all, I would like to thanks with Indonesian pro uh, project, especially Pahal and the teams who's inviting me. Uh, when Pahal asked me to uh, present something, uh, he said, can you talk about uh, Indonesian people mobility? I said, that's lovely. That's my interest so far, <laughs> because I uh, I recall back my first uh, impression to demography is uh, with my senior colleague from uh, Aris Ananta. Uh, he asked me which field do you like in, in demography? There are fertility, uh, mobility, and migration. I said, sounds migration is much uh, fun and better. So starting that uh, onward, I really choose uh, migration as my field one. Uh, I'm going to talk about people on the move, uh, looking at specific more current in 2010 census. Uh, for those who are uh, interested in census, I just used from the sample that provided by IPUMS Center from University of Minnesota, but they got uh, this one from uh, BPS, of course. So my, my first one is uh, to ask everybody here is uh, uh, why do people move, including Indonesia? There are many uh, answers that you can say that one, but at least there are at least two things you can say. Uh, there is always uh, people want to move because diversity, in terms of regional diversity, including uh, physical, socioeconomic, and so on. Even something that, why I would like to come to Canberra, because there is ANU, uh, which I don't have in Macquarie in Sydney, so that's why I would like to come. So there is kind of like diversity that you're really looking forward to see something different, at least, okay? The other one is opportunity, whether opportunity is going to give you more uh, incentive or not. Uh, there is kind of like uh, opportunity. So for example, why should I come to Canberra if there is no flight? So shall I, I will drive. So there is no drive, I will walk. If it, it means I have to take a risk in order to get opportunity. The only thing is whether people would like to take that risk or not, that's in another question. So it depends on the opportunity available and then uh, risk as well. Okay, talking about Indonesian diversity, uh, one in particular for people uh, in terms of population is the first one is regional diversity in terms of population distribution. It's been in literatures and the studies that always uh, the highlight between the more advanced uh, islands like Java, Bali, and Sumatra, and then the rest of the countries, which is, uh, you can have a look here from this big circle that you have. Uh, so most of the Java island has the biggest uh, population, okay, which is only like 5% uh, uh, distribution of the island, but they can like more of the almost 50 or 60 percent of the population. So it's really huge diversity in terms of population distribution. The second one that I would like to highlight about diversity in terms of population is uh, demographic. One is population growth rate. Even at national level, we have kind of like, kind of like moderate 1.5 percent, but we still have very high uh, population 
growth rate in uh, one province, like in Papua, and then the lowest one we have in Central Java. Because of that uh, population uh, growth, uh, as you can see here, I just put the two examples of population in North Sumatra and uh, population in Yogyakarta, which is, you can see the age structure getting much, much like aging uh, population age structure. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, Yogyakarta, uh, above 60 and plus is already 15%, uh, close to 15%. Uh, in, at national level, we still can like have 5% uh, for the population aging one. The last one for uh, demographic indicators, you can see here uh, variation in terms of fertility rate as well. If in the past we have like uh, banyak anak, banyak rejeki, now the norm becomes kind of like having uh, less children is uh, better. Uh, even uh, slogan from Bebat KKBN is kind of like uh, dua, dua anak cukup saja atau dua cukup saja. Uh, but there is kind of like confusing, they said, dua cukup or dua anak cukup saja. <laughs> but anyway, so kind of like that's diversity in terms of uh, population. To summing up about uh, the complexity of diversity in terms of demography, of course, it's going to highlight uh, about the impact to the population growth, uh, which is uh, you have natural, which is birth and death, and migration, which you do have people move internally and internationally. So if, for example, according to demographic transition, almost in every region in the world, people kind of like the, the, the country tends to have the higher fertility in the first place and then suddenly declining. That phenomenon has been occurring in many places in Indonesia. So the question is that once that the natural increase already declined, so what is going to be contribute to the population growth? Of course, some migration here. So the question is that whether which one is bigger and bigger, international or internal one? So far, even the number increasing over time in the census, uh, people overseas uh, international migration in Indonesia, but still very low uh, interna in, at the international context. So internal migration is still kind of like play roles a lot in terms of population growth in Indonesia. Uh, almost at the end of my presentation later on, I'm going to talk about the recent uh, phenomenon about Indonesian diaspora. Just before the coffee break, they asking about uh, somebody would like to know about Indonesian diaspora, so hold your time, so I will come to that point, okay? That's diversity. Now go back to the opportunity one. I remember pa, uh, the book from Fahal and also a colleague from ANU talking about in the past about Revolusi Corp. That's one of the kind of like contributing about people mobility whether the accessibility to the village, bringing kind of like with the uh, cold mobile, which is so kind of like they call it as revolutionary cold, kind of like motivate people to uh, move uh, within uh, far distance. What about now? Can we call it as revolutionary motor? Can I see that? <laughs> uh, the question is that why has to be put in motor? Because everything has been kind of like fast and uh, so far. We have the mass transport like uh, the busway. We do have kind of like motor here. Even you can look at uh, the increasing number of motor is quite, quite impressive and very big one. The question is why motorcycle is so much one? Uh, there are a lot of studies looking at that one, thinking about uh, the first reason is because much cheaper than others, okay? But also much faster. So using fa uh, motorcycle, even people now mudik uh, pulang kampung, they're really take a risk, just put the children and the wife and also the back in the motorcycle, even very long distance from Jakarta to Jogja or from somewhere else. Imagine you just using the motor one. Uh, the other one is uh, less maintained rather than with the car. Cheaper, the first one, but also quite easy to maintain one. The other one is what about the other trend in terms of transportation? It looks like we do have new trend compared with the old style train and the ferries one. With the trend uh, here, the number is not really kind of like jumping quite high one compared with the uh, flight one international and uh, in, in particular in domestic one. Seems like this become a new trend for everybody. It's kind of like in particular after the deregulation in terms of the airspace has become cheaper and also a lot of, even somebody said, I don't want to take Tiger or I don't want to take uh, 
it could be somewhere is not going to your home, but rather than somewhere else. But still, it looks like become a trend among Indonesians, like trying to uh, use the new trend is uh, using the flat one. Okay. The, another phenomenon in terms of mobility is kind of like uh, train now is also kind of like the phenomena of fly in and fly out in Australia, which is mining one, but they call it which uh, PJKA, Pulang Jumat, uh, Kembali Ahad. So <laughs> they, they go back uh, to the home village like uh, in Jumat or the weekend, they stay, and then early morning in the uh, Sunday, uh, Monday, they can like go to the, uh, the office. It's like Pulang Jumat, Kembali Ahad, or uh, uh, Sunday evening one. So it's kind of like the new trend among Indonesia, and particular in capital cities like in Jakarta and Surabaya as well. Another opportunity that also look like that could be forced about the people mo uh, movement is the uh, uh, information access like television and internet. How many of us has no connection or mobile phone or anything with the internet like Facebook? Anybody? <laughs> oh, but Yogi didn't have. <laughs> In Indonesia these days, uh, we have almost like 20% internationally having internet access, which is in particular in the, at the capital cities like Jakarta, Jogja, and so on. But uh, in particular, I have looked here in terms of the f using Facebook is also kind of like quite big one. So one out of five Indonesian people may have Facebook. Ask this around whether you have Facebook or not, so you will find it here. Uh, so what these consequences here is kind of like Related with the uh, mobility, uh, we know from the theoretical point of view, mobility is having, like, having access, having channel or network. Uh, but at the same time, as being Indonesia is famous, kind of like being, uh, like to be connected and uh, having gotong uh, royong. And so it's kind of like you would like as a communal groups uh, society rather than just kind of like isolated one. So uh, it could be there is kind of like trend uh, having using internet user and also be f like a uh, TV here could push you uh, having information and then giving more knowledge about whether you want to move somewhere else or not and then giving more opportunity to choose one okay the last opportunity that I want to highlight is about development does it support the move or not well from the literature that I've read so far, uh, it does uh, support of the movement, in particular uh, during the foreign direct investment very high one during 80s, and also uh, that's creating of the job opportunities. However, at the same time, there's kind of like polarization going on. That's what Pat Tommy will talk about, uh, where we, call, we, we do have like call it Jabotabek, Jakarta, Bogor, Depok, Tangerang, Bekasi. We have Gerbang Kertoso Silo. We have in Surabaya, Gerbang Kertoso Silo and somewhere else like with uh, Solo as well, Kerta Solo. So there is kind of like polarization where it's kind of like centralized to check uh, to uh, the main economic activities sectors one. Uh, and also, uh, the last time that what we already discussed so far from yesterday until today is uh, about the uh, decentralization uh, project. About decentralization with migration, what I would like to see here is uh, looking at uh, if decentralization working, it's supposed to be support of the economic uh, uh, development in region. So once the economic development region has kind of like improved, that's kind of like motivate people to move around to that particular become advanced one. So that's what I'm going to see. That. The question is that whether this is already working or not until today. Uh, so again, uh, I would like to remind everybody here is uh, what I'm going to uh, is looking at whether has been going on uh, different between uh, before the centralization or not, uh, but still, I have no conclusion whether it's working or not, just looking at the pattern from the current one from 2010 census. For the re migration region, I'm going to use uh, SUPAS, which is 2005 SUPAS, because looking at the pattern, for example, why people move from one uh, province or one district to the other district, there is no answer, yes or no, from uh, census. Only SUPAS giving even very broad, like uh, 
uh, economic reason, education reason, housing, security, and so on. But still, uh, may not answer what we are looking for. Okay, so there are four main uh, patterns that I have from my uh, current research. One is uh, higher in short distance because I look at the movement uh, inter-islands, inter-provinces, and inter-district because the, in the census now we do have until district level. Unfortunately, there is no until village level or overall movement like in Australia. In Australian census, they're asking whether have you moved anywhere. So it's kind of like, have you been moved? Even just to the neighbor, they ask you because of different address. But in Indonesia, very uh, unfortunate we have only a, a district level at this moment. And the second one is about more interregional migration to adjacent regions. So it means just the uh, a matter of uh, function of distance. The third one is uh, more uh, going to more inward Java rather than to Javanese, uh, the Java Islands. The last one is uh, in terms of the reason or triggers is also there are more stronger economics, but also there is another uh, reason so-called like uh, security issues. First one, about uh, the pattern. So the inter-islands is much uh, lower, and inter-province and also inter-district. What you can uh, conclude from this picture is uh, migration still very selective. The young one is kind of like much higher propensity rather than the old one. And we don't have so far for the pension uh, migration yet because there is not formal uh, activities, uh, very strong one. There's, if we do have uh, inter, uh, within inter-village, I believe it's going to be kind of like much, much higher than uh, the inter-district one. That's happening in every region. Yeah. It's not only in uh, at national, but also in the but a different level for here. <laughs> now, the question uh, pa, uh, pa, uh, how asked me where from and then where it goes to. Uh, here is, uh, I don't have the, uh, the 2010 census picture one. I re request and then I try with my GIS one, but it didn't work what, but I put it this one. Uh, according to 2010, in terms of number, I, I'm, afraid to put a table because everybody said, don't table again, don't table again. So I put this is a very similar pattern, okay? Uh, still a lot of it to Java, and then a lot of goes to Sumatra due to the, you know, lifetime migration is uh, because of the difference between the place you burn and then uh, the current one. So the lifetime is kind of like more accumulative of migration rather than recent one, okay? So that's what's happening here. Uh, so still kind of like uh, to the Sumatra, and then it's kind of like more the transmigration pattern in the past as well. But the current one I can put here is based on the uh, percentage. Uh, if you are living in uh, Sumatra, for example, you tend to stay kind of like or still or going around in Sumatra. And then if you're in Java, you still kind of like tend to go around within a Java. And if you are in Bali and Nusa, you kind of like still Java is much higher than others. If you are in Kalimantan and if you are in others, still Java and uh, is still kind of like nominate as well. But uh, the main point here is kind of like people tend to kind of like move closer. Uh, the so this is the function of distance. So, in terms of over time, actually it's true that the uh, inter island becomes lower, but Inter uh, district is much much higher. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, 1980s and 1990s, they don't have the question in the district, so I can't figure out. But if there is question, I bet I can say that that will be much much lower than that one. And then in 2010, we do have like 5.81 percent. It means uh, every uh, every hundred people, so about five percent uh, people kind of like moving within uh, the district one. Uh, in terms of urban and rural, uh, urban kind of like having much, much higher uh, in, th in terms of uh, everything, inter-island, inter-province, as well as inter-district one. What about the district level? 
we do have high out migration, but also a company with the negative net migration, like Jakarta. We, you can imagine why people from Jakarta Pusat going out. It's because of the development issues. Uh, but uh, what my point here is about urbanization here uh, is not always the highest urban level people going out, but also like in Nias, in Jayapura, uh, in Pontianak, Sorong, and Tanatoraja, they have lower urban, uh, urbanization, but still old migration is quite high, but also negative net migration. With the high odd migration but positive net migration, almost every uh, urbanization here is kind of like much, much higher than the other one. The other point that I would like here is uh, what about uh, Professor uh, Chris Manning asked yesterday about whether the migrate going to, from uh, lower level uh, development or not. Uh, I come up with the idea looking at because you don't want to get conclusion uh, uh, with the tables kind of like uh, development before and development after, but also looking at how high your uh, migration is. This is kind of like a hypothesis from Harris Todaro looking at the opportunity, the expectation. It looks like among Indonesia, still even uh, the destination having lower development or lower of the unemployed, uh, higher unemployment, they are still take risks, I want to go, rather than just stay there. It's about, uh, for development, it's about 13.49, and then for uh, employment rate, even higher, it's like 25%. That's one uh, answer I would like to say is due to, because of the reason, uh, it's not always about economic, but also about uh, family reunion or marriage thing and so on. So as long as there is still kind of like the issues about not only economic reason, but this one, take risks even higher. I mean, like, uh, I don't care if there is uh, employment or not, but because of I have my uh, family there. So I don't, I don't find, okay? That's uh, look at the duty for looking up job and looking for education in particular. Jogja is much, much higher, as you can see. But uh, the point from here is kind of like, Inter-island may be smaller, but inter-district about education is kind of like varies every level. It shows you that people tend to kind of like, uh, sorry, <laughs> last one, uh, looking for education, okay? Internet. Okay, just this is for the diaspora one. Uh, the recent one is uh, we do have so-called uh, Indonesian diaspora. Uh, the idea is because of we want to kind of like uh, make connection between one to the others. So just in 2002, uh, is initiated from uh, in LA, we do have like the first Congress. And then uh, this is what they have. Uh, at least there are three components what the, the diaspora would like to see. So far, we're only looking at Indonesian overseas. So people is Indonesian, but overseas. But diaspora would like to expand for those one is including those in the foreigner is kind of like because of intermarriage or because of you married with somebody else and from the children, but also those among individual uh, who is, has Indonesian linkage one. So, uh, so I believe everybody here has kind of like very strong, strong connection in terms of research and so on. You can call yourself diaspora if you want, but this is more kind of like social. More information, you can have a look in this website. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, Professor Hall Hill, and Pak Budiraso Sudarmo for inviting me to come here to present uh, a paper to the Indonesian conference. Uh, this is my second time because my first time was 18 years ago. As you remember, I presented on urbanization pattern in Indonesia. At the time, I still had, had a black hair, but now 18 years later, I presented a paper with gray hair. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, today, my presentation will be on dynamic of Jabotabek development. I think everybody knows Jabotabek is Jakarta metropolitan area. And the, uh, my presentation is actually 
uh, quite modest. Actually, I have 20 slides to present, so roughly speaking, only one minute for one slide. <laughs> That's okay, never mind. So basically, I would like to share with you the most recent development in Indonesia. Sorry, most recent development on Jabotabek, Jakarta Metropolitan Region in Indonesia. Uh, all the materials mostly taken from my uh, research in the past on many aspects of the Jabotabek, including population, uh, new town development, land conversion, um, potential impact of climate change, and recently on on uh, uh, governance. That's why I want also to discuss with you some possible urban governance system to manage urban development in Jabodetabek. The uh, presentation, my presentation will be divided into three parts. Part one will uh, discuss with you some uh, recent socio-economic and physical development in Jabotabek, including population, land conversion, new town, industrial estate, and potential Im impact of climate change. And secondly, we'll uh, uh, discuss also the need for urban go urban governance institution for Jabodetabek. And uh, the last one, the third part, will be on uh, conclu co conclusion. I know everybody knows, I, I think almost everybody knows about Jabotabek, but for those of you who are not familiar with Jabotabek, Jabotabek is, uh, uh, consists of Jakarta, of course, the city of Jakarta, the national capital, plus uh, five cities, yeah, uh, Tangerang, Depok, uh, Bogor, Bekasi, and the new one is uh, South Tangerang, resulted from Pemekaran from Kabupaten, Tang Kabupaten Tangerang. And three uh, Kabupaten, Kabupaten Bogor, Tangerang, and, and Bekasi. Okay, oh, regarding the population, according to the last census, the total population of Jabotabek is uh, 28 million. I believe right now it's close to 30 million, yeah? with rate of annual growth rate 3.6 percent. This is much higher than the national increase, which is uh, 1.45 uh, percent, something like that. I think Pak Terry Hall knows much better than I do. <laughs> um, the Jakarta city itself, the, the core of Jabotabek, had a population of 9.6 million. I believe now it's close to uh, even more, more than 10 million, but you have to add uh, another two million to to, the, to that number because if you in the daytime the population of Jabotabek is uh, about uh, uh, 11, 11 million plus because it's, uh, there are many uh, commute, com commuters from the uh, peripheral areas from Bogor, Tangerang, Bekasi coming and going every day to to Jakarta. Yeah, so in, uh, altogether in the daytime population is about uh, uh, 11 million. There is no, uh, I think the, the uh, two million is, it was estimated by uh, uh, JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. I, I, I don't know, I've never seen any study uh, about to estimate, which est estimate the uh, number of uh, commuters from uh, the surrounding area to, to, to Jakarta. Jabotabek right now is, I would call a private city because uh, I happen to make a core correction not six, yeah, but uh, five of 11 mil million plus cities in Indonesia yeah, uh, are located in, in, in that region. Jakarta itself, 9.10 million, 10 million, and then uh, Tangerang, Bekasi, Depok, South Tangerang is not, not reached uh, 1 million yet, and, and Bogor. Yeah, so you can imagine that nine uh, the million, millionaire city, million plus city in Indonesia located in, in that area. Yeah, so it's just like a Bangkok, it's called a private city. And Jabotabek is a, a play important role in the uh, Indonesian economy, in which about 20% of the national gross domestic products produced in that area. Of course, excluding uh, oil and gases. And uh, another interesting thing is that the proportion of Jakarta city population to the total Jabotabek is Jabotabek, sorry, declining over time, yeah, from, for instance, from 54.6% in 1990 to 35% in uh, 2010. This is uh, really reflects the process of suburbanization in, 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 in that area. I will talk to that later. Also, the rate of annual population growth in the quota, a city, yeah, cities and, and district surrounding the Jakarta, you know, Bogor, Tangerang, Bekasi, is very much higher than Jakarta itself. Take, for instance, uh, Kabupaten uh, Bekasi. I think Kabupaten Bekasi has uh, the annual population growth rate in Be Kabupaten Bekasi is 
um, three point something, yeah. Um, whereas the Jakarta City is only three, one, sorry, one point point three five, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So all the surrounding areas has a rate of population growth uh, higher than the the city itself. That's not happen only in Jakarta. Bandung also experienced that. Surabaya also. Yeah. All most big cities in Indonesia experience. So I will say it's, it's experiencing the sub suburbanization. That's first first issue about the population. The ne next issue is the land conversion. Yeah, Jakarta, uh, Jabodetabek experienced the uh, land use conversion, both in Jakarta itself, in the core of uh, the, the Jabodetabek, and the the outskirts. The built up areas in Jakarta increasing very significantly, and uh, so I'll give you an example that. There were uh, almost 15,000 co condominium units from com 40 completed projects which had been available in the last decade from 2000 to 2011. And also there are many 40 large shopping malls in Jakarta by uh, 2010. Yeah? The question is, ja ja does Jakarta need that much uh, shopping mall? <laughs> yeah? And fortunately, I, uh, I think last week I, I read from Jakarta Post that our I'm uh, sorry, Jakarta, new governor Jokowi will no longer issue permit for um, small de development in Jakarta. But for developers, there's no problem. They can, they can build the, the malls in the surrounding area in Bogor, Tangerang, and Bekasi. Yeah, yeah. that's why the need for uh, the inst institution for urban governance is very, very uh, important, very uh, pressing issue at the, uh, now. Yeah, to deal with the management of urban development in Jabodetabek. Okay, urban land use in the periphery area also uh, converted from uh, mostly uh, prime agricultural land to become to into the uh, like uh, uh, new town. I, I will show you some some picture. New town, uh, industrial estate, golf courses, yeah, and 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 many things. Um, in fact, there are there were 27 large new town project developed in Jabotabek by 2010. Yeah. Also, industrial estate yeah, is growing very rapidly in in the Tangerang Bekasi. The surrounding areas. So just to give you a, an example, this is the land use development in Jabotabek from 72 to 2010. You see that as, uh, the built up areas growing very rapidly. You can imagine if there is if no action is taken now, what would happen to to Jakarta, to Jabotabek in let's say 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years from now? Perhaps uh, the whole Jabotabek will become the built up areas. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, 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 the condition. This is taken from the uh, Ministry of uh, Public Works. Okay, this is taken. Sorry, I, I, I should admit, it. I should tell you that this is taken from uh, a, 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 my colleague's study yeah, with, with the World Bank on the, uh, the Jabuta Bank. And you can see that over the last decade, yeah, the built up urban, uh, the urban areas in, in Jabuta Bank increased from only 1,100 kilometers square in 2000 into uh, more than one, uh, fo uh, sorry, 1,400 kilometers square in uh, 2010. So imagine in uh, 10 years, the, the, the built-up areas increase by, say, uh, more than 300 kilometers square, yeah? That's what, what, uh, what happening. We need to, to manage this, this kind of uh, this development because it's just unsustainable. Uh, okay, just to give you, sorry, this is, the, I miss it. The title of this this figure. but it's taken from uh, Regina Suryajaya who is studying uh, the um, uh, land use development in in Jakarta. It's in Jakarta City. It's the uh, this picture show the development of retail office and apartment in Jakarta from 1970s until until present. You see the all the uh, retail office and the, uh, and apartments growing very very rapidly. Yeah, in this in, in the city Jakarta. Yes. Can you get an example? This is the one of the the uh, uh, apartment in Puri Casablanca apartment. Perhaps most of you know the Casablanca area. As far as I remember, 25 years ago when I was very very young, 30 years ago, <laughs> it was just just a residential area, you know, ordinary residential area. But now this area has been completely changed to become apartment, uh, commercial uh, space, and office, and and and, and many things. Yeah. So Jakarta experienced the land conversion like that. And the people going to the fring, to the to the Oscars, to the to, to the fring areas. Yeah, there's some um, uh, uh, salute show that the mi migration from Jakarta is sorry, uh, um, 
out migration is higher, and because we're going to 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 the, to the, to the, to the West Java area actually, yeah, Bogor, Tangerang, Bekasi. Oh, sorry, Tangerang belong to Provinsi Banten, but Bekasi and Bogor still belong to West Java. Okay, just to give you also an example, this is the location of the uh, uh, new town in in, ja in surrounding area Jakarta in Jabotabek. You know, this ranging from uh, 500 to 10,000, more than 10,000 hectares per uh, for each of uh, new town. Then new town is developed individually by each developer. Yeah, so you can imagine the fragmented new town. Yeah, it's very very difficult to you know to uh, provide the uh, infrastructure. You know, they they have developed their own infrastructure. Yeah, even in some some big city, some big new town like like Bumi Serpong Dami, for instance, management of the cities, management for the uh, water, for the uh, wastewater, electricity, done by the developer themselves, not by the city hall. Yeah, it's, it's uh, rather <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, it's uh, so, so something that uh, should be changed. <laughs> should everything should be under the. Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the local government has uh, little control on the, on the uh, uh, development of, of the new town. I'll tell you a little about it. Okay, just I have to go fast. This, <laughs> sorry, this is a, a, a example of a luxury house in Jabotabito. I, I believe in in base day. I imagine it is in Jakarta or something in or something in uh, New Orleans in Los Angeles. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> This what what happened in you know, the uh, okay. Let me give an example. You see the uh, infrastructure and facilities in Bumi Serpong Dame, yeah, including they have a uh, water treatment, sewage treatment. That's developed. Uh, sorry, managed by BSD uh, New Town uh, uh, developer himself, not by the city hall. Yeah, so it's kind of uh, uh, you know city within city. <laughs> Okay, some of the new town even uh, design as gated communities. Yeah, one 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 of the example is Telaga Golf Sawangan. Yeah, oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, you you can, you can see the site plan. Uh, all in the name of the, the cluster are foreign, like uh, Great Britain, Espanola, Bl Belanda, uh, what else? Miami, Monaco. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you see the the main entrance, the the gate. You know. Uh, not everybody can come freely to, you know, and, uh, should be uh, inspected by guard. Then, then even you have to make call to the person you want like to meet, you know, whether they accept or not. If not, then, then they, they, the guard will not allow you to go, uh, come in. Yeah. So some areas becoming some new town becoming really a gated community, just like in, uh, New Orleans. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, in, in in Los Angeles. I don't know whether it's access in. In Australia or not? Perhaps, perhaps yes. I don't know. I don't know much about it. Uh, okay, this is taken from my uh, dissertation. This is my my student on the she studying the uh, gated communities in Jakarta. You know, including the, the uh, all the facilities and uh, infrastructure in this region is exclusively only for the residents. Yeah, nobody from outside can use <laughs> the, the facilities. Yeah, okay, just to give you some as an example. This is the plan of infrastructure development for the Republic in the future. Yeah, it's, it's the, it will be funded by JICA. Yeah, uh, including uh, Tanjung Priok, uh, internal international airport, which is very controversial. No, uh, MRT will, will will start next year by Pak Jokowi, and then uh, uh, development of water supply and uh, many things. Yeah, so it's this five minute left. Okay. Okay, Jakarta also very vulnerable to di to disaster. Yeah, in flood, sea level rise, land subsidence, salt water in in Russia, many things. Yeah, so it's taken from my uh, my most recent study on on the uh, the vulnerabilities of uh, Jakarta coastal area. Uh, this is uh, done by uh, my colleague uh, Professor so Suroso from from ITB is doing some. You know, making simulation of the uh, inundated areas in uh, Jakarta and Tuta. So, if no action is taken now, then there will be like this: Jakarta is terendam, <laughs> inundated. <laughs> okay, that's just only a simulation. But it could happen if if there is no uh, adaptation and mitigation is 
uh, done now. Yeah. So it's very very. Uh, the problem is that I would say I'm sorry to say that maybe the local government Jakarta has still has little capacity to deal with the kind of problem to the uh, yeah. So the improvement of the uh, institution of, of Jakarta development is is badly needed. Okay, this is just to show you the the uh, the worst flood in 2010 in the fluid in the in the uh, northern Jakarta, yeah. And this one is also another, another problem is rob is the uh, tidal tidal flood, yeah, in in some areas in Jakarta, especially in the northern part of of, of Jakarta, yeah. This is not only Jakarta actually. If you go to Semarang, even worse than Jakarta and Surabaya also, also yeah. All the coastal cities experience this. Uh, this is to be, uh, you know, to be faced in our city's development in at least next 10 to 20 years to come. Yeah, do we ready? Are we ready for that? Yeah, we have to make uh, to improve our capacity to deal with this this problem. The special planning itself, yeah, it's good, but it's not enough. Yeah, necessary but not sufficient. We need to be able also to. We say we have to to put uh, uh, effort to deal with the, this kind of problem in our. Tata ruang, yeah. Well, in the uh, our conventional tata ruang is this is I'm sure this is not 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 yet there. <laughs> so now we have to change it. Okay, that's why the the problem with Jabotabek is is very complex. Yeah, very complex. Cannot be solved by each of the local government. Jakarta cannot be solved. The problem Jabotabek cannot be solved by Jakarta itself, but need to in involve other uh, local government. Yeah, district Bekasi Tangerang should be. That's why we need to be able to establish some kind of uh, uh, urban government institution. Right now, the management of uh, and permitting all of its job topic is done by called BKSB, inter inter uh, local government cooperation agency, agency. But the problem is that the BKSB doesn't have the authority on the implementation of development, especially under the decentralized policy, because the power is in the each local government. Yeah, Jakarta, Kabupaten Tangerang, Bekasi, but with some time is. Uh, you know, they call uh, egoism daerah, yeah. It's uh, because they have power. This is our region. So why do you, do you bother with with our, yeah, with our uh, prob our affairs, yeah? So it cannot yeah, Jakarta can, Jabodetabek problem cannot be solved by Jakarta by each uh, local government alone, yeah. So they have to work, to act to, together. Also with with the uh, assistance from the central government. That's what we need, yeah. But but now it's the local government because of the decentralized policy. Well, the, I'm not against decentralization. It's just very good thing, yeah, to make democratization works. But the, now what happened is, is it, with respect to the local, is they're fragment so fragmented. Yeah, that's that's a problem, especially in the Pemekaran, yeah, including in the as I mentioned the Tangerang Selatan. Yeah, the conflict between the mother region, the Kabupaten Tangerang, with the daerah Pemekaran, which is Tangerang, Tangerang Selatan. One minute left. Okay. So I have, I have uh, three possible options for mega uh, urban governance. Yeah, it's still to be discussed, of course, long. The first one is single authority, just like uh, uh, Tokyo or, or 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 Bangkok, but uh, obviously it's not acceptable in, to our undang-undang uh, pemerintahan daerah undang-undang tiga dua dua ribu empat. Or even with, with our our constitution. In our constitution, we we, we have three uh, level of government: national. Provincial, kabupaten, kota, yeah. So the there is no metropolitan government. <laughs> okay, the second one is two tier regional municipality, like just like in in Vancouver. Also, this is good, I, I think. But but unfortunately, I do, I don't think that that undang-undang pemerintah daerah and which is now being revised and our constitution also will allow this kind of. The next one, the the most uh, uh, plausible one would be the. Enhancing the role of function of PKS Media Yeah, that's it. Um, okay, just concluding my just <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I think uh, the process mega urbanization in Jabotabek in 2000 to 2000 is continuing faster, but largely un uncontrolled. I mean, why uncontrolled? Because in my opinion, that the role of private sector is very, very dominant. Yeah, sometimes the Rensa Tatarwang is can be violated, <laughs> you know. It, um, Okay, and Jabotabek region for renewable resources. On the whole, the recent development of Jabotabek reflect how the globalization economy. Maybe I would say liberalization of economy has greatly affected pattern of mega urban development. 
in which private sector play very dominant role. Yeah, one of the biggest challenge is to establish the uh, institution of urban governance. Okay, I think that's <laughs> time is up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm normally Peter McCauley, but right now I'm Henry Sandy, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity of uh, thanking Hal Hill and Budi for sponsoring my visit from Jakarta uh, <laughs> to attend, attend this conference. Uh, w why I've taken th this on is that I, I have done quite a bit of work on infrastructure myself, and this is a story about infrastructure. Uh, this session is, uh, is looking at uh, movement and corridors uh, across, across Indonesia and clearly logistics uh, are part of it and the whole discussion about uh, so-called connectivity is, is very fashionable. Connectivity and corridors are two buzzwords that uh, the development community has been talking about across the world and uh, part of connectivity uh, are corridors. So uh, this talk, as I say, is about the importance of logistics. Uh, Indonesia needs to move goods both within Indonesia and uh, outside of Indonesia around the region to link in with global supply chains. So the first point there is that global supply chains require uh, linkages. And it is an interesting factor, a fact of recent economic development in Indonesia over the past 10 or 15 years that to a significant degree Indonesia has missed out, has not taken part in the whole great movement of global supply chains linked with the massive expansion of China. China growing has sucked in imports from places like Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia and so on and recent studies including studies of students here uh, have been looking at it from the uh, in the ANU have shown that uh, an interesting feature is that Indonesia, to a significant degree, has missed the boat on this global supply chain phenomenon. And this may be part of the reason that the Indonesian manufacturing sector has been growing relatively slowly in the past 10 or 15 years, and jobs have not been created so quickly in the manufacturing sector. Now, that's the global side of it. Domestic supply is important as well. And domestic inter-island trade is clearly terribly important uh, for Indonesia. And there are, I think as many of us know, there are particular problems in the periphery, the outlying parts of Indonesia from Papua, eastern Indonesia, at the other end, Aceh, and so on. Now clearly the business of logistics involves many elements. It's, it's not a simple business. Uh, you, you need to look at the warehousing of goods, you need to look at the transport arrangements, information systems these days of course are terribly important. Uh, these days when, when, when many of us order something, uh, order something through the web from, from America or from Europe or something, or you have goods traveling internationally these days, you can often track the movement of the goods on the web. So anyone setting up logistic systems in Indonesia needs to develop their web systems and of, and, of course, there are issues of, of, of administration, uh, border clearance, and uh, a, a real problem in Indonesia is ports and shipping. Uh, perhaps my colleague uh, uh, Howard Dick should really be giving this talk uh, about uh, ports and shipping. Howard did his PhD uh, on, on ports in Indonesia quite a long time ago now. How long, Howard? Tigapulu Town, 30 years perhaps. Uh, those of us in the early 70s remember that Howard Dick would go around to these ports down to Tanjung Priok and Tanjung Perak and so on and he'd walk around the ports talking to people and come back with wonderful stories of, of the ports. Now uh, this slide simply tells us a very well known phenomenon. Uh, those of us who've been living in Jakarta recently will know this story that there are constant complaints and comments in the Indonesian media and, uh, and amongst consumers that it is uh, cheaper to eat jeruk from, uh, from China uh, than it is to import jeruk from Pontianak and even some of the fruit from 
Jatim from East Java, from Malang are more expensive in the supermarkets in Jakarta than are imported fruit. And people say, how can this be? How is it possible that it is cheaper to consume goods from America Serikat, from China, or from Australia than it is from Malang or from some other parts of Indonesia? Well, logistics have a lot to do with it. The, 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 the real problem that we are facing here is one of costs. The simple fact is that it is cheaper to move the goods from even a long way away than relatively close to, 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 to within Indonesia. Now you can see the figures here. Uh, the longest top line shows that uh, Tanjong Priok to Guangzhou uh, shipping costs are uh, US $400. Uh, to, uh, to Singapore, they're 185 And yet to move from Tanjong Priok to uh, Padang, which is obviously a lot closer than China, is $600. Out to uh, uh, Banjarmasin is uh, uh, 650 and a very high cost uh, to move out to Jayapura, uh, $1,000. So in terms, in economic, in geographical terms, uh, obviously Jayapura uh, is, is, is uh, maybe roughly the same distance, I guess, roughly, as Guangzhou, but in economic terms, it's much, far, much further. And what we're looking at here as an economist, uh, people who are looking at the economics of it, are the costs. We've got to focus on the costs, and we have to try to work out why are the costs so high and what can be done to reduce the costs. So connectivity and corridors uh, are a lot to do with that. There are, of course, also political implications. People uh, out in Jayapura uh, are very aware of the very high costs of, of goods. I, I don't have the figure with me, but I, I did notice the, uh, a month or so ago, I was astonished to see the costs of, of cement out in, in Jayapura. The costs of cement are four or five times, a bag of cement is four or five times the cost uh, that it is in East Java. And of course, this flows all the way through, people building houses, building roads, construction of infrastructure. All of this is much more expensive out in the periphery. And, and of course, people resent it. It leads to political implications. It leads to a feeling that they're being neglected, that they're not really part of this nation, that the people in Jakarta don't care about them. So the implications are quite important. Now, here are just a few figures uh, on the numbers of days needed to ship goods from Jakarta and Surabaya to Banjar Masin. Uh, the, 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 top, uh, the top set of graphs is X Jakarta. The bottom set of figures is X, uh, uh, sorry, the top is X Surabaya, the bottom is X Jakarta. It's, it's, it takes a little less time on average uh, so the, the highest figure from Jakarta is, uh, what is that, 11 days, whereas uh, out in Surabaya it can be 12, 13, 14 days. So strangely enough, it takes longer from Surabaya than it does from Jakarta. Now, where it's not just shipping, the same story about high costs uh, is, uh, is relevant in, in trucking uh, transport uh, problems across Indonesia as well, and, and those of us who've travelled around Java or other parts of Indonesia will know the enormous importance of, of trucks in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and trucking is a major problem, all sorts of major problems in Indonesia. The costs of bringing a container to the port in, in Indonesia are twice as high uh, as in Malaysia. So it's expensive even just within Java to move goods around by, by truck. Some 10% of Indonesian exports arrive at ports too late. So delays are quite common. And approximately, across, uh, uh, across Indonesia, approximately 70% of freight is transported by trucks. So policy directed towards trying to improve the trucking issue one way or another uh, is important. Partly because of this, the Indonesian government in its most recent uh, it's called the M MPTEGAE, the, the master plan, the master plan for infrastructure, which is perhaps the closest thing that Indonesia does have to uh, an infrastructure master plan. The, 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 the master plan has, has been promoting the development of railways uh, across Java. The, the Indonesian government is putting quite a bit of money into trying to promote uh, the, the movement of, of railways. The, the, the productivity improvements, by the way, can be quite dramatic. It's still the case, even today, that there is not a double line 
I'm talking now about railways, there's not, a, not yet a double line from Jakarta to Surabaya across the north coast of, of Java. Parts of it are still single, li single line. Now, uh, later this year or early next year, uh, they have been improving this double line problem. Later this year or early next year, there will be a double line uh, railway from Jakarta to Surabaya, and the productivity effects of this will be quite dramatic. It is expected that the number of trains that will be able to move from Jakarta to Surabaya per day, once there is a double track, will increase from about, the figure was something like from about 70, 67 I think, just under 70, to over 200 per day. So there's a dramatic increase in the capacity of goods to move from Jakarta to, to Surabaya. This, this indirectly, hopefully, will help the trucking problem. But clearly, Indonesia needs more railways, particularly on Java, but probably other parts of Indonesia as well. So part of the, way, part of the issue of ta tackling the trucking problem is to tackle the railway problem as well. And then there's the final point on the slide here, that a truck making a round trip from Bandung to Jakarta, it's not very far really, may spend up to 50% of its time parked due to customs procedures, warehouse delays, lift on, lift off queues, and so on, and, and, and I mean it's very common around Jakarta to see long queues of trucks stuck waiting and so on. And there's the awful problem of the port in Merak, the port from, uh, uh, the, the port which, which is uh, uh, the, the right at the west end of Java, from Java to Lampung, if you're traveling by road from Jakarta over to Lampung or to Sumatra, you have to go through the port of, of Merak and you get these huge queues it is not unusual for the queue to be going onto the port to travel across the Sunda Straits. It's not unusual for the queue to be 10 kilometers long. Uh, and it's, it's certainly not unusual for truck drivers to wait there for two or three days waiting before, that they, before they can get onto a ferry. Now it's partly because of this, of course, that the government is, is talking about building a Sunda Strait Bridge. Uh, there are pros and cons to the Sunda Strait Bridge. If they build the Sunda Strait Bridge, uh, the total cost of the current estimated cost of the project will be something of the order of 20 billion United States dollars. This will be by far the largest project, the infrastructure project that Indonesia has ever undertaken, and the 20 billion is probably an estimate. I'm so interested in this project, by the way, and I'm so worried about it. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a real risk that I have been working on a Wikipedia page. So if you want to keep an update of how the Sunda Strait Bridge is going, please look at the Wikipedia page on Sunda Strait, Sunda Strait Bridge. I'm trying to keep up with it. Because at $20 billion escalating, uh, it, it's quite an interesting story. Now, Indonesia's logistics, there are some figures for different countries. The left-hand side is upper middle income. The middle is lower middle income, and the left right hand side is low income. The story here is quite simple. That is, Indonesia's performance is not marvelous. There are countries that are a good deal better. These are on the left hand side. The best shown there is South Africa, uh, and the worst shown there far on the right side is uh, countries like Cambodia and Zimbabwe. I guess these are no surprise, and Indonesia is roughly around the middle. Indonesia does have a strategy. Uh, of course, the government, uh, government has a strategy. Most governments have strategies, and here's the strategy. I guess make of the strategy what one will. Uh, there's a logistics blueprint uh, as a pres presidential degree. Uh, there, there is constant consultation, as there nearly always is, with things like, uh, uh, with, with things like strategies. There are talk about quick wins. There are teams. Inevitably, in government, there are teams. Uh, but there are two cases to discuss these sorts of things, to discuss uh, these sorts of things. We've got two little case studies. Henry has provided us with two little case studies, one about cattle transport from eastern Indonesia and one about Tanjung Priok. So who, here are the two case studies. Here's case number one, study number one, just a few slides on cattle, transpo, tran, uh, cattle transport from eastern Indonesia. 
is a slide of the, uh, the logistics situation, and you can see that part of the problem is that the basic logistics out in Nusa Tenggara, Timur, and East Indonesia are really very poor indeed, very difficult. By the way, this of course is also a little bit relevant in the context of Australian-Indonesian relations now in the discussion of cattle, the development of the cattle industry in Eastern Indonesia. I think this illustrates that it, it, it will be difficult to, to develop the cattle industry in Eastern Indonesia. There's the challenge, the simple challenge, the logistics of transporting the cattle uh, from, from Eastern Indonesia, from places like Bima, from Nusa Tenggara Barat and Nusa Tenggara Timur across to Jakarta. They have to, be, they have to take them to Surabaya. Uh, they have to be uh, dealt with again in Surabaya and moved on to Java. Henry has provided us with some details of the costs. Interestingly enough, the first box, the big, the, 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 a large proportion of the costs uh, are from on farm, out, out there in Nusa Tenggara Barat, from on, moving them from the farm to the ship takes up uh, quite a lot of the cost. So the first, the first 10 or 15 kilometers are pretty expensive. And then there's the cost of, of moving the cattle uh, from, from uh, Sumbawa to Jakarta, the red column. And then the final, the final bit, the, the final few kilometers, the happy cattle uh, shepherded into uh, uh, go, happily going to meet, their meet the customers, the final consumer, uh, that's not costing too much. There's a blueprint as well, needless to say, yet another blueprint for dealing the with these things. It's noted that the, uh, there are problems of high costs. Uh, the costs from the farmer uh, to the port in Sumbawa are more than 40% of the costs. Costs in, in Sumbawa are identified. There are local fees, levies, port taxes, poor infrastructure. I think those of us who work on Indonesia know, uh, are familiar with these sorts of lists. And regulatory problems. Regulatory problems prohibit direct shipment to Jakarta. Challenges, poor local infrastructure in Sumbawa drives up the costs and there's a question of who's going to pay for the upgrading of the local roads. The port in Sumbawa is state owned and there are controls there, so there's a lack of competition uh, in this area. Terminal handling charges are higher than in Jakarta and Surabaya. There are regulatory uh, controls which limit companies about trading between Sumbawa and Java, and licenses are issued by the local governments. These are well-known uh, problems of, of licenses being, uh, it crops up in many areas, and, and there, there can be different interests between the central and local government. Second case study, Tanjung Priok. Tanjung Priok is said to be the mother of all challenges. So here's the problem. I think they've been, Tanjung Priok has been a source of interest to those of us who work on Indonesia for many years and promises to remain a source of interest. The demands on Tanjung Priok, this is basically a demand curve that's going up. It would surprise none of us. There is more and more demand for the facilities in Tanjung Priok. There's a logistics team, needless to say. There's a, a team that is trying to tackle the problem. There are problems of uh, they want to introduce 24 hours, seven days per week service. They want to try to improve the integration of inspection, faster introduction of the national service window, uh, higher penalties for importers that use, sometimes importers use Tanjong Priok as a storage facility uh, and to try to promote the use of a dry port in West Java. Now the hope is that all of these things will, it will, will speed up the service, but the trouble is that demand is tending to increase faster than supply. Here's demand, this is 2012 and into 2013, it's the past 18 months, and you can see that demand is, demand is, is rising. Challenges, so the challenges uh, in Tanjong Priok are that there are still no full-time services. The new Ministry of Trade and Agriculture regulations have led to problems. There's a so-called red lane system that doesn't seem to be working very well, and the dry, use of the dry port is constrained because it is not located in Jakarta. In conclusion, logistics matter. Indonesia has made progress in its logistics, but infrastructure remains a big problem. The government has, has issued a plan, not necessarily uh, so effective, implementation is the problem. This is often the problem. The plan is fine. We can get a plan. There's no shortage of plans. It's the implementation that's the problem. And there's a need for quick wins that show the benefits of logistics reform. Thank you very much. Terima kasih.
I'm just having a look at hell. We go until till 12? 12? Okay, yeah. Okay, then thanks for um, three great presentations. Um, so it's time for questions. And I suggest that since Henry's not here, um, we start with some questions for Salud and Tommy. Um, so the two questions here, these two, and one over there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Quick question for Peter McCauley. Uh, the case that Indonesian fruit is more expensive than Chinese fruit, I think the, the Ministry of Trade has to come up with engineer solution. Make the Chinese fruit more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so so as, as, as an experienced observer of Indonesia, do you think this guy will get the fourth? Thank you. My question is for Pak Salud. Thank you very much for the uh, presentations. I just want to ask you one question. Uh, because in Indonesia, recently, they say that the, f the migration is the face of women's migrations. How do you incorporate women's migrations? It is the face of migrations in Indonesia. I just wonder whether you include gender perspective or gender analysis in your uh, paper. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Penny Lukito. I'm from Bapnas. Uh, my question will be uh, toward uh, Ms. Uh, Pak Salud and uh, Pak Tommy Firman. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd like to hear more on uh, further thinking on the policy implication. Uh, what aspect of policy response to this um, uh, to this threat of uh, uh, carrying capacity I mean, toward the resilience of the city? and megacity in Jabotabek or any other megacity in Indonesia uh, toward the, this threat that you have mentioned, Patomi Firman, um, on their carrying capacity. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to my colleague, uh, Arif Yusuf from Bandung. Uh, uh, he, he, he commented that one policy response is to simply make goods from China more expensive. And indeed, of course, that is to some extent partly a problem. That is to so the response of some people to, to, to put on barriers to imports. If that happens, that simply pushes up costs in Indonesia. It lowers real wages and it reduces competitiveness ultimately in Indonesia. The, the long-term response is to tackle those problems of costs in logistics. Try How, how do we make logistics in Indonesia more efficient. There are ways of doing it. Uh, the breakdown of costs that we had there inter well, I thought was rather interesting. Obviously the first 10 kilometers or so uh, have very high costs. We have to identify where the high costs are and try to get the high costs down. It would probably be also useful to try to introduce some competition, so I, I don't always agree with people who are critical of liberalization and competition in Indonesia because competition will help to get some of those costs down. But ultimately, it's a question of costs. Ultimately, we have to get those costs down. Yeah, sorry, I didn't get your name. I was Busri. Yeah, Busri. Uh, of course, uh, gender will be in the analysis. Uh, I sent a draft already to Pahal that we still in the progress to finish it up. And uh, so far what we uh, tr look at the male and female, it is kind of like very close, but the female is earlier migrated. So it's kind of like uh, early 20s, but the male is kind of like more mid 20s in the peak one. Did something to do with, uh, as you see the reason, there are still kind of like due to not only economic reason, but also it's kind of like join with family, marriage, and so on. So because of uh, female that one, for definitely we incorporate gender perspective there. This, uh, the second about policy response, so that may be with Pat Tommy uh, directly. Thank you. Okay, the question basically is regarding the uh, uh, policy for sustainable development. Yeah, uh, basically it's, it's included in the analysis. In the uh, if you know the uh, rencana tata ruang Jabodetabek, it is PP Peraturan Pemerintah uh, Government Regulation. It's there, but the problem is again as 
Professor uh, Peter McCauley mentioned, it, implementation, implementation, implement. When it comes to implementation, it's, um, it's never been done, you know? So uh, when I was in school, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I believe that the, the uh, city planning will, you know, just, uh, it's a matter of the uh, technical, technical problem. Yeah? You have to be able to plan the land use and uh, uh, street and etc. But now I, my mind has changed very much. City planning cannot be done only if you, by the uh, technical, uh, if you have an only technical ex expertise. What you, you need is the policy impl implementation. So they become, that's why the, now the, I think it, uh, the field of public policy is becoming very, very important in the implementation of urban planning. The, the problem is in the implement implementation, that's right. Yeah, not, not in the planning. You can make a planning as good as, as possible, but when it comes into implementation, the problem is problem of politics, perhaps also politic, uh, some money also involved. Yeah, that's why the, the sustainable development cannot be <laughs> implemented because of it. In the analysis, you know, in the, in the uh, when uh, analysis for the Rancang Tatarwang Jabotadek, all, all is, uh, is uh, considered like uh, carrying capacity, like uh, green city uh, paradig paradigm is, is considered in, in the plan. But when it comes to implementation, it's just gone. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we'll one more round of questions. Um, I see lots of hands in the front, but I'd like some questions maybe from the middle or the back of the room. Uh, there's one there in the middle. Um, one all the way at the back. And any questions over there? There's one there, gentleman in the blue jacket. Yeah. Uh, thanks to the panel. My name's Joanne Sharp. I'm from Oz8. Um, Pat, Tommy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, up here. I should stand up. Um, uh, I find it, it's fascinating. We've all seen this experience of Jakarta growing and growing and growing and growing. It's fascinating to see some of those illustrations that you put up, so thank you for that. My question was just about um, other big cities in Indonesia and whether they are experiencing the same kind of growth uh, and whether uh, perhaps you are starting to see those, the same sort of gated communities in places from Balikpapan to Medan to... Surabaya, and um, whether or not there are some places that are managing the implementation of the plan a little bit better, or are we seeing the same kinds of problems all over the country? Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Santos. I'm working in Ministry of Finance, and I'm doing right now applied finance in, in University of Queensland. My question is to Peter. As you said before, that the, the problem of Indonesia is, in, is about the logistic problem. Uh, because I ever work in the, the eastern part of Indonesia, so almost 30% of the island in Indonesia, in eastern part, I already travel. And then something that I learned about the logistic problem in, in eastern part, or particularly in the small island in, in, in eastern part of Indonesia, is the port in more island is not available. And the second, some of the uh, some of the ship uh, to to bring uh, from Java to all the small eastern part, eastern island in, in eastern part of Indonesia, is controlled or monopolized by, I'm sorry, Chinese Indonesian, and it's just bring by small ship, and it's just correlated with the policy of Indonesia when you talk about the policy of Indonesian government. Uh, I'm talking about also about the policy of World Bank because when Indonesian government, particularly Ministry of Finance, try to build infrastructure to find in, to fund the infrastructure, 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 we need more money. When you, when we need more money, we raise that from you. So, I'm talking from from myself. This is my opinion, not on behalf of Ministry of Finance. When you talk about policy, and we talk about money, and we borrow from you. The biggest problem is right now is more than 10% of our national budget is that on behalf of World Bank. And that, that burden this generation and the next generation. Can you imagine how, how we can, how can 
fund the next infrastructure for Indonesian and to keep up the China's condition. So my suggestion and my question to you is, can you reduce the debt immediately so this generation <laughs> will not be burdened and the next generation will know hurt more? Because if you talk about the, the infrastructure, we talk about money and huge money, not small money. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, my name is uh, Rizky uh, from, from Krava School. Um, my question is for uh, Pak Tommy. Um, I want to ask more about the uh, Jabotabek uh, transport integration and authority uh, that you mentioned before. Is it already has, um, well at least designed or, or maybe uh, passed um, um, proceeding at the, at the some legislative or something like that and, and all the stakeholders and can you tell me uh, about the progress of that? Okay, the, regarding the, 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 the first question, whether this, I would uh, replace the, the question, whether the same phenomenon also taking place in other cities in Indonesia. Yes, that's right. But of course, in small scale. Like in my hometown in Bandung, there is a small uh, gated communities. There is in, in Bandung, yeah. Monks, so how many monks in Bandung? The same thing, yeah. So the pattern of uh, city development in Indonesia. It's almost the same, <laughs> yeah. Mall and uh, new town, get the communities. If you go to Surabaya, you will see the, the, the same phenomenon also taking place there, B uh, except in the, the much smaller scale than there in, in Jakarta. How do you deal with that? That's, that's the uh, problem. To, uh, to tell you frankly, I don't know. But I think, I, uh, hypothetically, uh, hypothetically, I would say that that's why we need the, the uh, urban governance institution, yeah. And number two is what we need is leadership, special leadership from the uh, head of the uh, local government. Yeah, like in Surabaya, for instance, Ibu Tri Maharani is, is very successful to manage. We need that kind of uh, of leader, you know. And as you know, that maybe you learn from newspaper or uh, uh, magazine or whatever that there are two type of leader in, in local uh, local leaders. One is as good as Jokowi as and the other one is even even worse. Yeah, um, the, our Ministry of Home Affairs said that about half of of the local government leaders, including governors and and uh, uh, bupati and wali kota, is has a problem with you know <laughs> something related to the corruption. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's true. Everybody knows in Indonesia. Yeah, I think that we we need that, that, that in order to so. I'm not too pessimistic about decentralization. Decentralization has produced new uh, leaders. Yeah, of course, the, the result is still uneven. Patsy, you know, some there are some good, there are some bad. That's okay. This is we are in the still serial process. You know, U.S., United States, you know, and uh, need at least 200 years until this <laughs> this uh, uh, condition right now. Yeah, Indonesia just we have only for just just 10 years. It's okay. We have to be more patient. <laughs> and secondly, about the uh, transport uh, inter uh, integration plan in, in Jakarta, as far as I know, there is a plan, yeah, for the whole, uh, for the whole Jabotabek. I mean, I mean no, that, that tra transportation is not only, uh, uh, should not only de develop for Jakarta, but should for Jabotabek as a whole. Yeah, the problem is that so far there is no, uh, I would say, coordination between the the uh, governor of Jakarta and the head of the local government in the, in the primary, you know, they need to, to work together to, you know, to solve the problem of, of transportation. Yeah, Jakarta cannot design the transport for, for themselves. Why? Because every day so many commuting, so, so many commuters coming from Bogor, Tangan, Makassar to Jakarta. So it should be, should be integrated. In that case, I think the national government, the central government should take action <laughs> Jakarta cannot cannot uh, you know uh, expand their their uh, plan to other areas. You remember that about uh, when the gov I think some seven or eight years ago when uh, at the time the, the governor of Jakarta was Pak Pausibowo, 
they propose which is very good uh, proposing a Jakarta me megapolitan yeah so it include Jakarta with uh, the surrounding area but the proposal has been rejected by the uh, government of West Java accusing that Gubus Biyoso wants to uh, encroach some of the uh, area of, of Jakarta yeah I think that's that's my 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 answer to to, to the question. I'm not uh, to tell you frankly. I, I don't know much about the transportation development in in uh, in J J Jabotabek. But recently, I heard that Jaika is interested to develop uh, uh, transportation network for the whole Jabotabek. Jabotabek. Hope it works. But now, uh, right, right now, as I, as far as I know, this uh, uh, Pak Jokowi is is uh, you know. Uh, planning and developing MRT, yeah? City is still within the Jakarta city. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, we have to stop it here because we're running way over time. Um, now, Hal will very soon tell us where we, will, where we can have some lunch, but before that, please join me in thanking the speakers.